Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evil 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays today at 9 a.m. If you're <coughs> looking to see any of our past videos, you can go to our YouTube channel, Calvary Chapel Inland, and check out all our messages there, our devos, but also our Wednesday evening and Sunday morning messages are there also. So if you're in a neighborhood like to join us, you're more than welcome to, to join us uh, here at the church at 5383 Martin Street. Good morning, Patty, Dina, uh, Diane, Diana, I believe, Patty, Weeks. Let's see who else is here watching now. And everyone else who won't wave to me, good morning. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll continue on in the word. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for just the encouragement last night, Lord. <clears throat> it's good to be encouraged, Father, to, to see the <clears throat> community out in, uh, on October 31st, Father, and, and trying to reclaim Halloween and make it into something pure, into our harvest carnival, yes. Lord. Uh, as we played worship through the whole event, Father. People were, were enjoying themselves uh, from couples to families to children to babies. Lord God, it was just really nice to see the community here and, uh, in hundreds, Lord. <clears throat> I believe uh, we probably had anywhere from three to 400 people here, Lord God. And Lord, what was really nice was the comments that I got from several of those that have come and have been coming for the past years and, and even said we'll be here next year. Lord, they, they thanked uh, the church, they thanked the people uh, for opening up uh, this opportunity for them to have a place for their kids to come to and have fun and, and just really be um, enjoyed, Lord. And so, Father, we thank you for that event. And it was encouraging, Lord. It's good to see uh, so many people, Father. And now, Lord, we, we begin a new day November 1st, Father. We ask that you lead us and guide us, Lord. Minister to us through this devotion before we begin our day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, Becky. Glad you could join us. Anybody else on there that I didn't see earlier? Nope. Looks like that's it. I already said hi, Diana. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are in Hebrews chapter 6. So if you want to turn your Bible there. In chapter 5, we saw Jesus, our high priest. Uh, he's going to continue on talking about that subject of Jesus being better than Moses, Jesus being better than our high priest, Jesus being better above all things. And, and he gets to a point in chapter 6, he says, Therefore, uh, and of course, therefore meaning whatever happened before, this is my point now at this time. And he's going to talk about something that we all struggle with as, as far as interpreting like when when is somebody saved and are they saved uh, once they're saved well can they lose their salvation um, or were they even saved and that's a question that is brought up oftentimes about these next eight verses and they're brought up because people are scared that maybe they're walking the line and they're not walking with the Lord and so they're like, am I crossing that line? And if I cross that line, can I ever come back to the Lord? Or people just want to know, uh, does God save you and that's it? You can just uh, be saved and never lose your salvation. So uh, what is the answer to those questions? I used to like Pastor Chuck's answer. He never would answer it. <laughs> he would always just go around and give a great study about salvation and message and so forth. And then always end up back at, at John chapter 15 where he said, if you abide in Christ... Christ will abide in you. And so he said, just make sure you're abiding in Christ and you don't have to worry about whether saved or not saved because you're abiding in Christ. And that is a good, good message to give, you know, because <clears throat> you don't want to give people the message that, yeah, even if you uh, fall away, God still saves you. Um, it could be that you're not saved and you don't want to chance that. You want to make sure you're constantly abiding in Christ. So let's read the text and then I'll expound on it and hopefully give you some clarity to this text. You might want to put a big box around these eight verses here and, and put a little star or, or something just to make it pop out. It says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or to maturity. 
um, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So Paul is saying here, we need to grow up. We need to, we need to mature. We can't be living in that baby state, just like a baby. You know, eventually they grow up. They stop eating baby's food. They stop drinking out of a bottle. They grow up. They have learned things, and they're learning things, and they continue to learn things until they're old. And so, so is our faith. We can't be in that place of, oh, I've got to repent. Lord, please save me again. In the beginning of our salvation, yeah, that makes sense because we're not sure. We don't, we don't have that faith yet. And so we're constantly saying, Lord, please save me. I keep sinning, but I, I hope I'm saved. I confess you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. And we go through this confession all the time. And there's a point that Paul is saying is that it's, you need to stop doing that. You put your faith and trust in Christ now. Believe that and show the evidence of that, basically, because it is faith. I read a post this morning on, on uh, Facebook that said uh, it was faith that started your salvation and it is faith that will end your your salvation unto eternal life and that is true but i think that we sometimes quote these things without giving a balance because james says without works your faith is dead so it's not just faith it's not just faith that saves you there's works there that god prepared beforehand that you should walk in ephesians 2 8 and 9 says and james makes it very clear that if you have faith you also have works and this is where christians um, struggle. So they think, well, I've received Jesus into my heart. I've asked him to be my Lord and Savior. I believe it by faith. And then they go and live their life as though Christ isn't a part of it. They don't go to church. They don't tithe. They don't serve. They don't, you know, witness. They don't evangelize. Uh, oh, at home, they think about God and things like this, but they don't do any of those. There's no evidence of their faith. So their works are dead. <clears throat> and Paul says, I'll show you my faith by my works. I have works that are evident of my faith. And that's a scary place to be. And, and I know that <clears throat> for those that <clears throat> are there, they're, they're, in their mind they're thinking, but I know God in my head. And I love him in my heart. And, and I believe in him. I don't read his word. I don't pray. I don't go to church. I don't do all those things. But I know he's in here. No, he's not. The Bible is clear. The Bible is clear. Uh, what it teaches, and it teaches that true repentance, meaning turning from your old life into a new life, if that hasn't happened, then chances are that you are never saved, and you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you are saved and you're in that place, you won't stay in that place. Something will continue to, to eat away at you until you realize, I've got to go to church. I've got to be involved. I've got to do something. That is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. So, leaving that basic principles and, and walking out towards God, he goes on and says, For the doctrine of baptism, the laying on of hands, the, of resurrection of the dead, of the eternal judgment, of this we will do if God permits. For if it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the ages to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucified again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks it in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those who, by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God, but if it bears thorns and bristles, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burnt up. And he qualifies uh, this thought with that example of rain coming to the earth, right? What he's saying here is, look, there are those who have tasted, who have seen the power of God, who have proclaimed Jesus Christ, and yet they fall away. And if they fall away, they are unable to return to Christ. Then he gives that example of the rain. It's like the rain that comes down and there's fruit and it's cultivated and they enjoy the fruit of it. But if there's no rain and there's no cultivation, then what's there is just weeds and you burn it because it's no good. Mm -hmm. So he tells you right there, that person that falls away, and does, he cannot come back. And that it's no good, that it should be burnt up. Now let me qualify this. 
because you might be saying, oh, now I'm in trouble. Uh, if, if you're listening to me like, oh, I'm a little scared now. <clears throat> um, we have two examples of this. The first example is Judas Iscariot. Judas, in fact, uh, Acts 1, 17, I believe, uh, talks about Judas Iscariot being a part of the work of God, even of the Holy Spirit. And yet, look what he did. He fell away. The Bible says he was filled with the devil. Then he went and he hung himself. Was he saved? No, he wasn't saved. Did he have the opportunity to repent? He did, but he never could because his heart was already hardened. And that's what happens when someone falls away. They harden their hearts, and there's a point where they can't repent and turn back. So it's a scary place to be. Another, another example of this, and if you want to turn there rather quickly, it's in Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> and Jesus gives us this parable. It's a wonderful parable so that we don't have any doubts. And he talks about the parable. You know it. The parable of the seeds, right? Chapter 8, and it's uh, the soil, uh, and we're, we're going to go to verse 11. And we know the parable and how the seeds fall in different grounds and how it's cultivated. But then the answer is in verse 11. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And so everyone comes to the Lord Jesus Christ through the Word of God. Somebody's preaching to them the Word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Mm. So there's those who hear, but then something happens, they hear other things, and then they decide, ah, this isn't it, and they walk away, and they're not saved. They never become saved. They don't have salvation in Jesus Christ. Oh, they might have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, and so forth, but then something pulled them away. And that's the devil, it says. The second seed, and there's four seeds, but the one on the rocky, the seed that fell on rocky ground, are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. These guys received it with joy. And these have no root, but there's no root. And, and the word root there means it, it didn't grab hold of it firmly, has no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away also. Now, the belief for a while is, is the eros tense, so it's, it's punctilar. So it's not telling us the amount of time. But when you read this, you might think, well, they believe, and then all of a sudden, within a month or two, they fall away. No, it could be years. It could be years. It could be receiving the word with joy, being in church, doing a lot of things, and then years later, just fall away. We, saw, we have an example of that modern-day example with Billy Graham. He had an assistant pastor that, that fell away um, after helping him with a lot of crusades and so forth. And then he went on to write a book about there not being a God. So it, it happens, and it proves that the Word of God is, is true. So again, don't think you're safe because, well, I've been doing this for 20 years now. You know, yeah, but... There's a possibility, and so you have to cleave to Jesus Christ. Look at the next seed. The one who fell among thorns are those who, <clears throat> when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. Now, those are the wealthy people. Those are the uh, ones that make a good amount of money. Those are the ones that enjoy the pleasures, the riches, and, and, and the cares of life take them away. And anything that they do is choked out. And again, they're not saved. But the ones who fall on what? Good ground are those who, having heard the word of the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear it fruit with patience. And the word keep it is in the present tense. In other words, they continually keep it. And so it is a choice to continually keep practicing the word of God. So Chuck Smith is right. Abide in Christ and he will abide in you. That is the key. So that gives you some examples of what he's talking here about. He's talking about those that probably never really knew the Lord. And the cares come in and they choke them out and they just, you just can't bring them back to salvation. So, and we'll have further discussion afterwards, I'm sure. So let's go ahead and finish up the chapter. Verse 9. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Isn't that wonderful? As he's writing this and he's talking about those that fell asleep, uh, 
like Judas Iscariot, uh, those who fell away. Um, then he says, but you guys, God has something better for you. Uh, like us, we're here, we're listening, we're hoping, we're praying that God will use us. So something better, things concerning you, yes, things that accompany our salvation. Uh, though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You notice who he's talking to? Those who have true faith, those who have works, they go together. Uh, years ago, someone, someone came up to me, and they were a little upset. And they said, you know, every Sunday you get up there and you talk about how we should be serving, and we should be serving, and we should be serving, you should be doing something. And she's like, where does it say that in the Bible? <laughs> and, and I'm kind of like, all over the place, you need to read your Bible. God, God calls us to be servants. Jesus was the example of it, right? He came to serve and not yeah. be served. But they didn't want to serve. They didn't think they had to serve. And I says, you need to read your Bible. It's all over. And so um, probably about two months later, uh, after me getting up there and almost every Sunday when I'm reading a text, it's talking about serving or works and things like that. You know, I just continue. And they came up afterwards and they says, you know, I was thinking about what you said and started looking up the word servant and so forth, and you're right. We're called to serve. We need to be involved in doing something, mm -hmm. you know, and that person has gotten involved. So it's neat to see how the Holy Spirit works yeah. in someone's life and that they're willing to, to hear the Holy Spirit and to obey the Holy Spirit. You know, it, it's sad because, and this is the hard part for every pastor, you have a family that, that supposedly they love God, they know God, uh, the, the, the guys, they can know doctrine. The devil knows doctrine. They know the Trinity. They know the truth. Is the devil saved? No. <coughs> Demons are, aren't saved. Um, and these families come in to church once in a while. They don't go to church all the time. Now, I'm not talking about satellite church. I'm talking about real church. That's not real church. That's not fellowshipping with the brothers. And so they... They think going to church once in a while, but they never serve. They're never doing anything. They just come, they consume, and then they leave. They don't even give. And, and chances are they're probably not saved. And it's sad because that's a mama with some little kids and stuff like that, and they're misleading those kids. And those kids in the next generation probably won't be even going to church or thinking about Jesus Christ. And that's how it, it, it's passed on to the next generation and next generation. So I say that in, in love because you're doing great damage to your family by not getting involved. And you know, those of you that were not involved before in a church and are involved realize how important it is and what it teaches us as we are involved and as we're ministering. So Paul says, look, look, God has something better for you that are actually working and doing things. And then he goes on, verse 11, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. So he's encouraging the reader. Look, you work too. You do something too until the very end. That you do not become sluggish. The word is lazy. We don't like that word lazy. The word is lazy. -e. I don't like laziness. I, I never have. My dad was not a lazy person. My mom was never a lazy person. Uh, I was never a lazy person, and I made sure my boys were not lazy guys. We didn't let them get away with anything. You know, oh, they're too young, they can't do it. No, come on, get out there, pick up rocks. You can pull weeds. You know, I don't care if you do it right, but I'll teach you to do it right eventually, and they worked. They worked. By the time my boys left home, they knew how to cook. They knew how to wash dishes. They knew how to do laundry. They knew how to do anything that, everything that you need to do to, to live out there in the world. Because we taught them not to be lazy. And, I mean, did they want to be lazy? Of course they did. You know, they laid in bed. Come on, get up. Oh, I don't want to get up. Can I just get up? No, get up right now. Oh, and then get up right now. Turn the lights on. Pull off the sheets and get your butts going now. You know, oh, all right, Dad, all right, Dad, all right. You know, because laziness is not biblical at all. That you... Do not become sluggish or lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. For when God made a promise to Abraham, 
because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Saying, surely blessings I will bless you and multiply I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Who was that? Abraham. And James even tells us that uh, Abraham <clears throat> believed by faith, but it wasn't his faith that saved him, it was his works. Now I thought works don't save us. It doesn't. It's our faith, but it's the works that evidence of our faith that saves us. And James says that. Read the book of James. I encourage you to read it, read it today and get that uh, balance there. And so Abraham believed and it, it was accounted to him to righteousness. And James says because he had works and that was the righteousness. Thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutableness, the immutability to the heirs or of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation or comfort who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So God has done all of the work, and because we also work, we are able to enter into the Holy of Holies as Jesus, who was the forerunner, did for us. And now we have access to the throne of God. We can now come boldly to the throne room of God and ask in prayer whatever our needs are and he will hear us completely. So these are great words that Paul encourages the church here. What, what he's basically saying here is, look, there are those within the church, and we know that in the Gospels, right? That there are tares and there are wheat. That there are goats and there are sheep within the body of Christ. Now, how do you remove all the goats in the sh from the sheep and how do you remove the tares from the wheat? You don't. You can't. That's impossible. I mean, you'd like to hopefully find out which of those people are really not Christians and they're just troublemakers. And you'd like to ask them, just leave. You know, you don't need to be here because you really don't want to be here. So why are you here? But you never know if God is working in their hearts and so you don't want to push people away. So we allow them to stay in church so that hopefully they'll hear the gospel and they'll turn from it. Last night at the event, I was praying, what do I say, Lord? I want to say something, but I don't have time to really, you know, expound what Jesus has done. And so I thought, all right, Lord, I'm just going to let them know that you love them. <laughs> And I'm going to repeat it at least 10 times. And I must have repeated it 10 times. And I just wanted them to hear it and, and, and so forth. So when I raffled off the, the, the bikes, you know, I, I should, should have said, and I think I said, you know, we're giving you this gift and it's free. It says, but God has given us a gift and it's his son, Jesus Christ, and it's free. And it's a better gift than these two bicycles. Says, and because Jesus loves you. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you. And I even said, whatever you've done, whatever you've been through, Jesus loves you. He can help you. And again, Jesus loves you. And I said it over and over. And I was watching the video afterwards. And I could see people listening to me. They were actually focused on me. I've never seen that before from an outside perspective. You know, Carlos took a video of it all from, from the classroom uh, ramp. So he had a view from a little higher. And I'm watching the people and they're just listening to me and I can see them going like this. And there was one gentleman that if you were to look at him, you, you would think, oh, he's, his heart is hard towards the Lord. But he's sitting there with his head down and he's going like this. He was agreeing with me. So they know that Jesus loves them, that Jesus cares about them. And I wanted to just really, really emphasize that to them more and more. Um, in hopes that they'll come to church, that the Holy Spirit will lead them so that when they go home and they go through something, they'll remember those words, Jesus loves me. I can go to Jesus and Jesus can help me. 
and, and those words would radiate and God would use them uh, to hopefully save them. Um, one gentleman came afterwards and he just was really appreciative of what we do here. But he did not want to come to church. But he was really appreciative of what we do here. And he thanked me and for all the servants and for everything we do and, and that his kids are safe. They have a safe place to go and a place where they have fun and they have food that's good food. He even said it's very good food, delicious food, uh, and, and, and candy, lots and lots of candy, more than they would get if, you know, and so forth. But he wouldn't come to church because I'll be here next year is what he said. <laughs> you know, and those are the ones that I just say, Lord, please open up their eyes Amen. and their hearts to you, Lord. Because though they're enjoying life and they feel like they're connected somehow to God because they go to this event, which they're not, um, they're lost. They really are lost. They don't know Jesus Christ. They don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's more of a religious relationship. And that's what Paul, if he's the author of Hebrews, is saying. Look, there's people who have this idea and concept of who Jesus is but they don't have any works. They see it happening, but they don't personally do anything about it. They're lazy, they're sluggish. They just sit around and they just consume, 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 and never give out. And, and Paul is saying here, it's like the rain. It's supposed to come down, hit the ground, cultivate, and you have fruit, but it's, it's not raining. The ground is so dried up that nothing comes up. And whatever comes up, you just take it and you burn it away. It's no good. And that's how they are. And he qualifies that very clearly like Judas Iscariot. And those are the ones that scare me because they have a sense that they know God, but they really don't know God. That's how Judas was, right? He walked with him. He did miracles with him. He saw the Holy Spirit working, and yet he didn't know God. That's a scary place. So we need to have works to show evidence of that. And, and what that means is, is that if you're in that place today, and this is the challenge for those of you that are listening, here's the challenge. If you have felt convicted by my words, and I'm not the one doing it, it's the Holy Spirit if it even convicts you. If not, then, then you know, I pray that it does. But here's the challenge, is if you realize that I don't have works, I don't have the evidence of my faith, then you need to start praying that God gives you the evidence and that he'd help you to be active in the kingdom of God so that you would have that assurance of your salvation. Amen? So pray. In fact, we'll pray for you right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray, Lord, because we do love uh, all your people, Lord, and the people that you're calling into your kingdom, Lord. We pray, Lord, that they would have the evidence of their faith, Lord, that work, Lord God, the, the work of righteousness, Lord, a work where they're reading your Bible, where they're praying, where they're gathering together with believers and literally fellowshipping with them, Lord, where they're involved in ministry, uh, where they're helping out like at a harvest carnival, Lord. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. It's not easy, Lord. But Lord, it is through your power and might that you give us the strength to do these things, Lord, because we know they're right. And, and though these bodies ache, we still do it because we know it's right and because we're your children, Lord. And we cry out, Abba, Father, use us. Even in the Old Testament, Isaiah said, you know, he called, where is that man to stand in the gap? Where is that man? Where is that man to say, here I am, Lord, God calling us to stand in the gap of our brothers and sisters. <coughs> Lord, may you call us to your work, Lord, in your kingdom today, Lord. While the day is still early, Father, call your people, Lord. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, please post them. Or you can private message me and we will pray for you as we take time now to pray. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.